I'm Alan Kasuja, and this is Africa's Big Philanthropy on the BBC World Service. Some of the world's richest people have been giving away billions of dollars in the name of global development. Warren Buffett and Bill and Melinda Gates announced their idea of the Giving Pledge to give at least half their wealth away. That would add up to about $600 billion. I'm exploring how this big giving affects lives in Africa, how it plays into debates about the role of international aid and whether philanthropy can help solve some of the world's biggest challenges. Food security is a big issue on the African continent. A lot of the African countries don't grow their own food. Zimbabwean philanthropist and entrepreneur Titsi Masiwa. A lot of them that produce food are producing a very limited variety of food. The quality of food that then becomes available to the greater population is not as diverse and is not as rich and is not really as nutritional as one would want it to be for a whole host of reasons, from poor investment in research, patterns of climate are changing, also people keep growing the same things that don't work anymore. In order to tackle some of these problems, some big philanthropists have been putting a lot of money into developing agriculture on the continent. Really, our ambition is to seed and drive the transformation of agriculture across the continent. Managing Director of the Rockefeller Foundation Africa, Mamadou Biteye. Our resources are risk capital. We invest in research, in finding new solutions that have the potential of radically changing things and helping these farmers close the yield gap, generate production that can not only ensure their security, but also generate the surplus. Between the 1940s and the 1970s, a so-called Green Revolution was spearheaded by the Rockefeller Foundation in parts of Latin America and Asia. Large-scale agriculture was promoted to tackle farming and increase economic growth. Not everyone agreed with the high-intensity scientific methods, but it was declared by others a success story. There was a green revolution based on new seeds, and it raised nutrition levels, it reduced poverty. It was one of the, the great breakthroughs of all time. Now we need to bring that advance to Africa. In 2006, we have established in partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. We are part of a revolution, a new green revolution. We are Agra. Agra works through every stage of the process, from getting the small farmer started financially to helping him prosper in the marketplace. Join us on our march towards a green revolution. Titsi Masiwa's husband, Strive, is the outgoing chair of Agra, part philanthropic funded global initiative which aims to make farming more productive. I think the investment that is going into institutions like Agra is so critical to ensuring that we don't end up with this huge population growth that is dependent on importation of basic food. Chief Executive Officer of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Sue Desmond Hellman. Agra has funded the production of 734,000 tons of improved seeds for African farmers. It's provided scholarships to 683 PhD and master's students to learn better agricultural technology. And it's helped 5.4 million farmers learn about better farming methods. Those are the kinds of things with higher yielding crop varieties, better seeds, better understanding about soils that African farmers need to cope with climate change. Those are very specific investments that we at the foundation think are extremely important for smallholder farmers so that they can feed their families and have some economic productivity as well. Agra and its partners work with farmers, seed producers and distributors in countries like Kenya, where agriculture is integral, not only to food, but also a social, economic and political issue. We are walking through Machakos town. Machakos is the biggest city in the east of Kenya. It's quite busy, actually. A lot of trading happening here. It will be interesting to hear what they make of agriculture, of agribusiness. 
and how much influence does philanthropy have on the lives of farmers here? Seeds, fertilizers. Sami Ombedu runs a small shop in Machakos selling agricultural products. It's quite stocked, this shop. You have all sorts of things. I see biosafe disinfectant fluid, I see poultry microbes. So who buys from you? Farmers from Machakos, counties which are around here. And what sort of problems do they face, those farmers, when they come to see you? Crops that have been invested by insects or uh, fungi. And have you found that the demand is growing? Are you seeing more farmers coming to you? Yes, and demand is growing because uh, when we opened, we used to get just a few farmers coming. But now we get many farmers every day coming with this, all sorts of issues and we are able to help them with the products we have. In a country where some places don't see rain for up to three years and in the face of serious problems like crop disease, scientific solutions like better seeds, fertilizers and pest control seem like a welcome solution. But not all farmers are happy about what they see as outside pressure to change their centuries-old practices. The future of small-scale farmers is in danger because of the element of control. It's conditions. You have to use their seeds, chemicals, you have to use their chemicals. Pest control, we have no... Problem. General Secretary of the Kenya Small Scale Farmers Forum, Justice Lavi, is a keen advocate of traditional organic farming. He and others are worried about the prospect of new technology being pushed onto farmers. The majority of the population, almost 85% are small scale farmers. And that is a huge market for whoever is bringing a product. And today we find that uh, because of chemicals, a lot of seeds uh, also get adulterated. And uh, these chemicals have come with the killing of bees, killing of butterflies, and that affects pollination. And uh, we also need to protect our biodiversity. Like in our area here, we have traditional varieties. A lot of parts of Kenya, like eastern Kenya, where we are at the moment, can barely feed themselves. And as a result, it would be important for us to increase productivity, to increase output, so that there is more food for everybody. And this area, I hate to say this, but Ukambani, which is the area that we're in, is famous for struggling to feed itself. It, people here go hungry. So what's wrong with making sure that interventions which could help feed those people are introduced, like drought-resistant seeds? If the area has not seen rain for three years, it is a fallacy to tell us that maize is going to, be, to resist that sort of drought. One big fear for some people is the prospect of genetically modified seeds. Bill Gates has expressed support for GM in the fight against starvation and malnutrition. But apart from South Africa, most other countries on the continent have so far resisted, and it remains an emotive issue. Autonomy for every farmer is very important. We would like to protect those varieties of ours from Colonization by GMOs, because... Colonization our, by yes, GMOs. Yes. But is that efficient? Is that sustainable? As the world begins to demand more food, as people grow, as families grow in size, as the need for more food production increases, is it sustainable to retain those traditional modes of practice? Yeah, it is. So long as we bring in technologies, we bring... Um, but it's just technology that you're resisting. There are specific technologies that are appropriate to us. The technology that we want here um, in our area is um, technology for rainwater harvesting. If we would have come here in the month of uh, May, it was flooded. And April. all that water went to waste. And that water went to waste. So you want to be able to harvest all that water? We want, instead of uh, money being put in GMO, give us money, we harvest that water and we can be irrigating this place. Kenya has a ban on GMO food imports, but has carried out field trials on GM crops and commercial cotton and maize could be a possibility in the future. Other governments are also looking at relaxing legislation and investing in trials. But some farmers are concerned that chemicals associated with some GMOs could cause environmental and health issues, and Justice is worried farmers might get tied into paying international seed companies who own many of the patents. Mamadou Biteye from the Rockefeller Foundation. I don't think that philanthropists are imposing any kind of genetically modified agricultural policy. What are the seeds that can be prioritized, distributed? All of that is a decision of government. Philanthropists cannot take a particular seed and bring it into the country. I believe that most of the rejections of new technologies 
are mostly emotionally motivated. My point of view is that we really need to increase our research capacities. We need to increase our knowledge about these things to be able to make recommendations. The worries, I think, are not unfounded. Titsi Masiwa. GMOs, are they effective? Are they the answer to issues of nutrition that we face on the continent? And then also there's the whole, I think, concern around big companies coming in and dumping cheap products on the African continent. It's a real danger. We also have to realize companies are in business to make money, to make profits. And there will always be tensions between making profit and improvement of lives. And who is the right arbitrator to ensure that we don't end up in a situation where Africa once again becomes so dependent on products or produce from the West? Some philanthropists are putting money into other technologies like irrigation. But some farmers are still worried that big corporations which dominate the global agriculture business see Africa as the next big market for their products. I asked Sue Desmond Hellman from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation about the concern that big philanthropy is too close to big business. Every time we work with private industry, we have a clause in the contract that says that there has to be a charitable intent to our investment. And what that translates into is that any private industry where we make an investment, the outcome of that, whether it's of seed or some new technical advance, has to be priced affordably for people who cannot afford it. It's extremely important to us that farmer worries about their ability to use these technical improvements, specifically seeds or fertilizer or other ways for them to work, are affordable for them given their local conditions. Speaking to some farmers, they've said that they're worried about the impact of agro's focus on monocultures as well as scientific solutions. They say too many chemicals and also the prospect of genetically modified seeds and also losing their traditional crops and organic pest control. They're worried about some of the fertilizing methods. What do you say to them to reassure them? Oh, I think it's extremely important that the farmers have a very specific voice in this in terms of what they're looking for and what they need. So we hear those farmers' voices, but we hear them very loudly on traditional crops like cassava, where they do have pests and they've had a marked decrease in their productivity. And so looking at newer methods and looking at scientific ways to think about how to make sure their productivity on traditional crops stays higher or gets higher is an important thing we've heard from farmers. The other thing I would look at and I would feel reassured by is the governance of AGRA. So AGRA is governed by a board of directors where there are many, many local African voices, and they are making sure that there's not one voice, and specifically the concerns about multinational companies and the role of big agora or big corporations is appropriate and not overweight. So one of the best ways to make sure that local voices are heard is to have local experts. A large local seed company just outside Machakos has had investment from Agra. It produces improved or hybrid seeds, which are not genetically modified, but crossbred scientifically to improve quality. Walking through sacks upon sacks of seed, and uh, women are working on uh, weighing scales and sealing packets of seed. Our latest uh, hybrid, which we have commercialized in the last two years. This is a copy. Uh, these are very brutal-run products. Managing director of a local seed company, Ngila Kimoto, grew up in this area. He got involved in seed development, he tells me, because he wanted to make a difference to his own community. I started asking myself, why is it that people from this area do not have enough food? And what did you what, find out? What can they do? And I thought, people starve here because they don't plant the right seed. And that is how I started uh, this seed business. Farmers have to pay for hybrid seeds to retain quality, whereas traditionally seeds can be saved and passed down the generations. So what about those who fear that they might lose control of their autonomy? Because they traditionally farmers have their own way of doing things. Mm. They have been growing from time immemorial. To introduce something that they are not used to, you have to convince them why, what is going to be different, 
what is going to happen to their own saved seed, saved over the centuries. They have that fear that they are going to lose. How do you respond to those fears? Because they're genuine fears. Very genuine. They're very genuine. And the only way you can respond is by demonstrating. Well, what are you telling them? Because if I come to you and say that my century's old variety, which tastes amazing and is organic, is now going to be replaced by something that is more technologically advanced, what do you say to them to reassure them? Yes, that is a big challenge. Actually, farmers don't accept easily. But you demonstrate by planting either your own demos or demonstrations or you plant with them to see the difference in terms of disease resistance, in terms of productivity. If it doesn't produce more, then you have a problem. If it doesn't taste as good, the farmers will reject it. Technology is something that you cannot resist. What about the idea that Western philanthropists have too much influence? over the whole control of the seeds, which is another fear that some small-scale farmers have mentioned. Agra is an African institution, so there is uh, very little to fear as we work with Agra because most of them are our own people. They belong here. It takes time for farmers to change, but with the time, from what I've seen over those years, I know adoption is going to increase in the next 20 years by a very big margin. So we have the confidence that what they are bringing to Africa is something that will not be harmful to Africa. Umekuwa mkulima muda gani? Kwa miaka miwili. Miaka miwili has been a farmer for 2 years. Eh mimi ni mkulima wa mahindi. Mutuku Masao has taken up farming recently to improve his income. Sukuma. Okay so you plant kale, you plant tomatoes and maize as well. Are the kiasi gani? On what sort of land? Eka ka aina. On four acres. Yes. What did people tell you about seeds when you got involved in farming? So they told you to just stay with it and work hard uh, because farming is good and you'll be able to support your family with it. What challenges have you faced? Rain. Rain, disease. Diseases come again? Masao tells me he does keep back some money to pay for the seeds, but he gets a good yield. What do other farmers say, your friends especially, about these seeds? They'll also be doing the same. They like the way things are going. Kulima ulikuwa Taxi. Oh, you're a taxi driver, public taxi. Yeah. Which one is more beneficial? What you're doing now, what you did in the past? Farming. Farming is better. Yeah. I think in a very positive way, enhancing how the private sector can work for smallholder farmers, not only locally so that they can sell in local markets, but is there a future in Africa for agriculture to lead to net exports so that they can not only provide food for their families, but they can sell their products? For some farmers, this is already a reality. This is a shack of some sort, and it's about 50 meters. How big are they? Uh, this is about 60 meters by about 15 meters. This medium-sized mixed farm in eastern Kenya has vegetables, fruit, and livestock, including chickens, and also exports French beans to the EU. My name is John Muya. This is my farm. We are sitting on about 30 acres of land. He set it up not with philanthropic funds, but with bank loans and after working for many years as a pilot. How many chickens do you have in each of them? We hold about 6,000 in each. 6,000 in each. And how many do you have in total? We have a total of about seven. So that's 42,000 chickens? Yeah, just that. Just that? Yeah. This is an example of a self-sufficient homegrown farm which survives without philanthropic intervention and is proof of what's possible but it does have its challenges. The hardest thing about this farming is not having enough funds to expand as we would like to see, because the challenges will be getting money to buy pesticides, seeds, you know, feed for the chicken. And that opens you to philanthropists who can come and offer you all those things. Offer you. Offer so, would this farmer welcome philanthropists if they came knocking at his door? Definitely we must be sitting on equal flat platform. <laughs> Obviously. What are the chances of that happening? They have the money, you don't. I have the land. They are coming to Africa. I'm an African. But in a situation where they have the money, 
you don't have the money. Mm. If somebody has got something to sell and the other one has got the money, I'm sure they are on equal equal level. Look at your farm, it's successful. <laughs> Over 40,000 chickens, big supplies to big customers. Yes. But that's not the same for many small-scale farmers though. The small-scale farmer, he must know the details about the whole thing, what, you, the, what it involves. Because if there's something hidden, then somebody else should be free to decline or accept. Small-scale farmers may welcome and benefit from philanthropy, but they're not really equal partners. And some people question the belief that business models based on market forces and returns on investment are really the best approach to philanthropy. The American billionaire Warren Buffett, one of the richest men in the world, has been giving away a lot of his money to charitable causes. Peter Buffett, I'm the co-chair and co-president of the Novo Foundation. The Novo Foundation was created in 2006 after my dad, uh, I call it the Big Bang. He famously gave all his money away. And my siblings and I, there's three of us, all received billion-dollar foundations. Peter Buffett set up his own charitable foundation, but he's also wary of the big business mentality of some philanthropists. Philanthropy comes generally from, well, it always comes from having a little bit of excess money and sometimes a lot. So you get into a business mindset in terms of finding solutions. If the solutions worked in business, you carry those into philanthropy. My biggest criticism is that it's not looking deeply enough at its own behavior within the system and structures that it resides in. When you just look at the resource extraction from Africa in general, I mean, anywhere there's a lot of money moving back and forth, somebody's either extracting or trying to make up for it, I think, in a lot of ways. And this is certainly not to disparage anybody's behavior or work, because I think everybody's doing their best within the frame of what they know. But what's at the root of it, really? Is it really there to solve issues that our current system has created, or is it there as part of that system? I've heard that conversation around capitalism and some of the consequences of capitalism and issues with the system. Sue Desmond Hellman. And questioning the role of philanthropy and whether or not philanthropy just enhances that system. Here's the way I look at it. I think there's something incredibly valuable and important that someone who's had wealth does when they decide that some of that wealth should be given back. How one gives back and how one challenges some of the systemic issues that could enhance poverty, I think is a really important public dialogue. But I also think there's so many positive things about private industry. We want that passion, that talent, that pace that private industry has to be able to help with the things we're working on. We look at where there's a market failure and say, how can we use philanthropy to create potentially new markets where now companies that would never go to those markets can actually see some new customers? The other thing that is said about this same issue is that global corporations might actually sneak into Africa. I use the word sneak very carefully here through philanthropy, and that many of them will just simply extract resources from the continent. I don't worry about it, but I actually think that just like philanthropy, the private sector has to be accountable. Another small-scale farm in Kenya has a mix of crops, trees, and bees. Are they harmful? No, they are not harmful. He's calling for a bottle of honey. honey. So that you can see what, what oh. we produce. Okay. We harvested the other day. And so this is all organic, is it? My name is Musembi, Otto Edward Musembi Ndenge, and uh, this is my little farm. How big is it? Uh, it's a five-acre land, but we utilize all of it with mixed farming. Okay, so let's just create a world now where there is an opportunity for you to vote for philanthropy. International philanthropy, yes, or international philanthropy, no? So what would he and Justice Lavi choose if it was up to them? Uh, international philanthropy, no. What about you, sir? How would you vote? No, of course. <laughs> Why? Because they're not helping anybody. It's a scheme of getting in so that they can reap more from Africa. But they're trying to do good with their money. They're trying yeah, to give back. That's what you say, but they also want their money to stay. They want to sustain that uh, bigness, that number oneness, that number two-ness of uh, having the biggest money. So you don't really think that they're doing it for moral reasons? I don't know. 
I'm just uh, putting in a word that uh, since they are the richest people, they want to control so that they stay the richest. Global agriculture corporations are already investing in and developing new technologies on the continent. But is philanthropy really, as these farmers seem to think, a way for big business to exploit African people and resources? Mamadou Biteye. I don't believe in that. I haven't seen it in my work. I haven't been in a space where we have been talking about how can we exploit this continent better or how can we favor a particular company or not. And I think that if that was the case, you cannot call it philanthropy. And I believe that other sister philanthropies or brother philanthropies cannot be accused of that. That's my strong belief. That's my strong point of view as an actor in this space. It's not only wealthy Americans who are giving their money away. Some of the richest Africans are also joining the ranks of big philanthropy. So next time I ask whether the future of giving in Africa could be homegrown. We can be only partners. No one is going to address the challenges of this continent to develop this continent but Africans themselves. I'm Alan Kasuja, and Africa's Big Philanthropy is produced by Joe Wheeler. It's a Just Radio production for the BBC World Service.